the introduction, which many of you already know, is you are in the heart of Assembly District 10, which is mm -hmm. Assemblywoman Rochelle <laughs> Wynn's district. Uh, she made history here in the state of Nevada as the first Asian American Democrat to be appointed to the state legislature just recently. <laughs> so, and, uh, as you know, we're a very uh, fast-growing population, the fastest-growing uh, APA population in the entire United States. So to have representation in our state legislature is a very key thing. So without further ado, yeah, Assemblywoman Rochelle. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Rochelle Wynn. I am the Assemblywoman for this district, Assembly District 10. Um, and I am very excited to be here. Um, I'm fortunate enough to bring light to the AAPI community. And anytime any of the political candidates running for the nomination reach out to me, I am happy to be here to shed light on our population, our growing population, and some of our unique needs. Um, I'm very excited here to introduce Mayor Pete Buttigieg. I know this is not his first time. I believe his first kickoff um, event here in the state of Nevada was actually an AAPI event, so I'm excited that he is back um, to answer some questions in what will be hopefully more of a dialogue and a Q&A session here. Um, mayor Buttigieg set, spent the last eight years serving as the mayor of a hometown in his hometown in South Bend, Indiana, where he's been fighting for progressive change in the heart of the Midwest. I recently had the opportunity to be a part of an Asian American de delegation of state legislators that went to Japan um, to kind of um, talk about manufacturing jobs, talk about like business and industry and education and climate change with some leaders and our counterparts in Japan. And I was had the opportunity to be with a representative, a Korean American from the state of Indiana, and he had nothing but good things to say about um, Mayor Pete. Um, I know that he has some new approaches and some new ideas, and so I'm sure we will be able to ask him plenty of questions about those. And with that, I will turn this over, and um, please help me in welcoming um, him to Nevada again. Well, uh, first of all, I want to thank you, uh, uh, Assemblywoman, for your leadership and, uh, uh, and, and wish you very well in your upcoming uh, election. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, and I'm so honored to be with you and Evan as well for uh, everything that you've done uh, uh, by way of leadership and, and for helping to welcome us here. I'm thankful to the SEIU for hosting us, too, because uh, it really is an example of the kind of, of leadership that uh, we are going to need more of in order to make this an economy that works for us. Uh, the kinds of organizing that SEIU is doing, both with those they represent uh, and with the not yet organized, is what it's going to take for this to actually be a country where one job is enough, uh, which sadly is, is still not the case for so many. Uh, and I want to thank all of you for, for joining us as well. I will be very brief uh, by way of a few introductory remarks because I want to spend as much of the time as we can um, uh, in uh, dialogue about whatever most interests you. But, uh, let me share a little bit about what's motivating this campaign. I would not have guessed when I ran for mayor uh, uh, eight or nine years ago that at the end of my time serving my community, I would be seeking the American presidency. But of course, so many things are happening right now in our country that we did not see coming a few years ago. I'm running not only to be the nominee who can defeat Donald Trump, but to be the president for the day after. Uh, so I always begin by asking voters to visualize the first day that the sun comes up in this country and Donald Trump is no longer in the White House. Because by definition, this is actually a contest to be the president for that moment. Not only to bring that moment about, but to lead the country forward. And what we're going to need then is a president who can unify an American people that will be frighteningly divided and polarized and exhausted. And at the same time, do it in a way that will tackle the big issues that we still face, because the problem of racial and economic inequality, the problems of climate change, the problem of gun violence in this country is not taking a vacation during the impeachment process. Those issues will be crying out for action. And at the <coughs> same time, so will that question of unifying the country. And I believe the most important thing is to lead based on the values that we share that will lead us forward on the policies and can be used to help unify us as an American people. What I see at the other side of all the fighting is an American experience that is defined not by exclusion, but by belonging. Uh, our country is at its best when it builds up a sense of belonging. But right now, the message is going out to so many people 
that you don't belong. People are being told because of their faith, because of where they come from, because of what language they speak at home, because of their sexuality, whatever it is, in different ways for different people. People are getting the message that you don't belong. In order for America to succeed, it has to belong to all of us. And that's one of the reasons why it is so important to me to engage the AAPI community, as it has been important in the life of our own city, uh, where the contributions of uh, generations of people who have come, uh, in, including so many uh, who came uh, one generation ago, uh, largely from Vietnam and Cambodia, uh, as well as people from many, many Asian countries who uh, are part of the life of our academic sector, as well as our workforce. But also our campaign, uh, where I'm proud that leadership roles from our director of policy uh, to our national finance and investment chair uh, are held by Asian women who are doing extraordinary work uh, in, uh, in our campaign. So with that, I promised a very short introduction. There are lots of concrete policies I'm eager to discuss, but I want to make sure we do it based on whatever questions are most on your mind, and we'll uh, pause there and uh, uh, leave it to the group. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if we have, like, an organized way of having people ask questions, but I'll kind of just get the ball rolling, if that's okay. <laughs> um, I know that what's important to probably most Americans or most Nevadans are things like education, immigration, um, small business promotion, um, health care. But if we can just kind of focus, I guess, start with education. Um, where do you stand on and how do you plan on moving forward making higher education something that's affordable for everyone? Yes. So uh, I'm the son of two college educators, and I married a classroom teacher. So I get an education about education every day. <laughs> and education, of course, is the way to freedom and prosperity in the United States. And a big part of that is college education. Uh, the problem of college affordability is very personal for us. Uh, uh, I am, according to Forbes magazine, the least wealthy person running for president. And that's largely because of the six-figure student debt that we have as a household, uh, because I married a teacher. And I've seen the uh, effect that that can have on making it more difficult for people to establish themselves and get ahead. Uh, and the student debt issue is becoming a crisis. So we have to make college more affordable. What I've proposed is a federal investment that would fund a state-federal partnership to ensure that college is affordable for everyone and actually can make public college tuition-free for most. Uh, for families earning $100,000 or less, that's about 80% of Americans, uh, we would be able to make co public college, including community college, tuition-free. Um, as the income goes above that level, there would be a sliding scale uh, for folks in the top group uh, we would ask them to pay to, to pay tuition. Uh, but for all of those in that first 80 percent, we can cover the cost. Now, it's not just the cost of tuition, especially for the lowest income students that can be on, an obstacle. It's also the cost of living. And it's why we need to expand Pell Grants that can be used for just the basics of life, food, housing, that are so expensive, especially close to some of the uh, best residential public colleges, but really in so many different parts of the country. And we need to focus not just on the ability to pay for college, but making sure that people complete college. Uh, because the most vulnerable position to be in is to have a lot of college debt and not to have a degree, or not to have a degree that is useful. And this is why we also need accountability for for-profit colleges that took advantage of people, often not caring about whether they were going to complete their certification uh, or not giving them a certification that was actually uh, as, uh, uh, as likely as advertised to support them in economic opportunity. It's why I would restore the enforcement that the current Secretary of Education removed, that the Obama administration imposed on those schools that, that did not meet basic standards. And it's why I believe that when we talk about debt relief, we should begin with the debts accrued at those schools. I also would expand the generosity of the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. This exists right now, but it's almost impossible to actually take advantage of. So we need to revamp the whole program that allows for debt forgiveness for those who have uh, gone into a field of public service. I also have noticed that a lot of people talk to me about the debt burden that makes it harder for them to become entrepreneurs. And it's especially true for first-generation students and graduates, and often students and graduates of color, who are expected to be supporting family members as well as going out on their own. And it's one of the reasons why we want to make it easier 
uh, for these graduates who have an amazing potential to create economic opportunity for others who have been excluded uh, with what we call a debt for jobs guarantee. That if you're a Pell Grant eligible student and you go on to start a small business and create jobs, uh, then we will have debt forgiveness there too to make it easier uh, for you to succeed and build up those minority owned businesses that are creating so much opportunity. Just one last thing on education. <laughs> Sorry, I'm excited about yeah. this topic. And it's probably the one I've, I, I might have begun with, which is it also matters who's in charge. And I will appoint a secretary of education who believes in public education and who supports teachers. Wonderful. Um, this is kind of related, and it's a topic that I know that um, <coughs> is important, I think, just in general, is within the AAPI community, a lot of times we're seen as a monolithic group um, of just Asian Americans. And um, I know that there's a movement, or there had been a movement during the Obama administration towards um, quality data and collecting mm -hmm. quality data. So the um, disaggregated data, so you're getting more accurate data so you can target groups that need it um, and that don't. And I know that that's coming into play with the census. So Nevada counts. Make sure everyone um, is counted in the census this year. But um, how do you see incorporating that, or do you believe in the disaggregated data collection? Yes, this is important and is not talked about much. I'm a, I'm a bit of a data geek, so this is very <laughs> important to me. Uh, but also because uh, I've seen as a city how our community could be impacted if there's an undercount, for example, because of some of the manipulations that they've threatened to do for the census. That has a very real consequence of fewer resources, often going where it's most needed. We need these kind of data, for example, in order to uh, identify some of the problems we have with health equity. Uh, we know, for example, that uh, African-American women are three times as likely to die in childbirth as white women. Uh, we know that there are also specific health equity concerns in terms of uh, exposure to cancer, uh, mortality from certain uh, diseases including hepatitis, environmental justice concerns that might have a very different impact on uh, a Korean American uh, community than it would on a, a, a Pakistani American community. And we need to be able to gather the data that would make it possible for us to understand, largely so that we can do a better job of driving resources toward where they can lift folks up whenever we see a disparity, whether the disparity is in health or in education or in economic opportunity or in representation. And we can't do it if we don't have the data to begin with. Um, kind of shifting to immigration, I know that a lot of times people want to know what your general immigration-like plan or stance is going to be, but I, I think I have some more specific um, questions that people have brought up to me on several occasions. Um, do you have any ideas um, on what your policy is regarding like visa limits or higher priority for highly skilled or educated um, things where we're lacking in this country, whether it be in nursing? Um, I know we have a large Filipino community um, that participates in well, SEIU, so we're in there, <laughs> <laughs> their union. But um, uh, how, do your, how does your immigration plan plan to address like those visa limits? Yes. So our immigration system has not gone through a real overhaul since the 1980s. And a lot of these limits are encoded in law that need to be much more flexible. The country caps, uh, the visa limits, the uh, workforce permits, these should be revised every couple of years. And so in addition to the comprehensive reform that I believe we need to undertake to create a pathway to citizenship, uh, to establish a higher level of admission of refugees, uh, to protect those who are here who are most vulnerable, uh, whether they're on U visas or whether they have temporary protected status, to protect dreamers. Uh, we also need to make sure that in the future there's more flexibility in the system because the economy is changing. And often the economy very much needs and relies on uh, more immigration, but the system isn't set up to allow it. The country caps have no basis in modern reality. Uh, they create enormous backlogs and make it more difficult to reunify families. And so what I would establish is a two-year cycle of renewing and resetting uh, the caps and the relationship between workforce needs and immigration levels instead of having it cooked into a law so permanently that you would have to go back to Congress in order to fix it, which, as we've learned, is really something you only get to do once in a generation. And this is also important to me because uh, I'm here because my father 
immigrated to the United States. He came here for educational opportunity and then became a citizen. I wonder what would have happened if he were coming in the system that exists today instead of the one that exists in the 1970s. And I just want to open it up. Does anyone have any questions in the audience? And if you could um, state your name and talk loudly, and if you're with an organization, feel free to do that as well. I'm Abby Pepinock. I'm also running for some of the here. So and this is both a comment and a question. The comment is I've heard you say that uh, teachers should be paid like doctors and treated like clinicians. <laughs> Coming from India, where teachers are treated like doctors. Um, it is very close to my heart also because I was a professor mm. at a medical school. So the funny story is that I told my parents that I went to office. So they were like, you're too old to be this So <laughs> <laughs> because for them it was hard attack to go from a respectable professional yeah. teaching to Interesting. But <laughs> absolutely admire your uh, um, education policy. Thank you. So my question to you, going back to your comments, uh, if you were to really stop paying teachers like doctors, how would it work? Yeah. Would you have a plan? Yeah. So what we know is that community countries that really have that level of respect for teaching have better educational and social outcomes. And if we want to compensate teachers more like doctors, that won't happen without federal support. And so this, to me, is a big part of what federal funding uh, resources like Title I are for, especially because we can deal with two different but related issues. One is that teachers do not get paid enough as a general rule. The other is that many of our most vulnerable students are also getting less funding for students than uh, those who already have the most going for them. You know, in many, if not most countries, if you have an area where students have a greater level of need, you could expect that they would have more resources going there. But because of the way that most American school districts are funded with such reliance on property taxes, in many places in the U.S., the opposite is true. It's actually the students who are already the most in need who are effectively punished for being low income with the fact that their, their schools also have fewer resources. Now, this is what Title I is for, or at least in my view, it's part of what Title I can address. And part of why I've proposed tripling the federal Title I funding that goes to lower income schools is to address these inequities. There are many ways that we should apply those dollars, but one of them, I think, should be to supplement teacher pay. Because I've also learned about another dynamic, which is the effect that having a great teacher can have on the future lifetime earnings of a student. Now, one of the members of our economic policy team was part of a group of researchers who pulled a lifetime worth of IRS data. And they crunched all the numbers and they connected it to data about teachers. And what they found was that having one of the best teachers for one year in a kindergarten classroom made a difference of $300,000 per classroom per year in how much more those students would go on later in life to earn, just because they had that, that advantage early in life. And so by doing the right thing for teachers, we're also, and targeting it where there are the most students in need, we're also doing the right thing for a future generation of students by helping them to get ahead. And I don't think that we can expect local and state government to do this alone. We need to ask local and state government to do more. But there need to be federal dollars as well as a federal message about how we honor the profession. One other thing I would mention is an idea that, uh, that we're proposing that we call an education access core. And the idea would be to create a network of some of the most uh, highly rated existing teacher qualification programs, universities and colleges and programs around the country that train teachers and give them degrees, to give them a designation of being a gold standard that if you participate in this program, you'll have a license that's portable that you can take to any school district in the country. And if you commit to teaching in a Title I school for seven years, then you will also, throughout those seven years, have your, your loans deferred, and at the end of the seven years, have them forgiven. Uh, and, and it's part of both making sure that we're training and recruiting a new generation of teachers, but also setting up the idea of uh, really wanting to honor those who make the commitment to participate in that quality program and do it at that high, high standard. Do you have another question over here? Hi, uh, I'm Ben Wen. I'm a teacher here in 
plus time to go straight for the sixth year. Great. I appreciate your comments about teachers. You know, I'm a young person in teaching, and I've been uh, highly involved in a lot of things here in Nevada. I went from a uh, start placement in physics at Southern Mountain High School, out of one school, which uh, I learned in 2012, had like a 38% graduation rate, the lowest rated high school in uh, our county. And at that time, the nation was, you know, Nevada's ranking in education. So I went to the school, and I said, you know, there's some challenges here, but I want to I fix things. I want to do something about this. And it's not just education I saw the issue. Schooling, which mm. is, as a country, we really need to really think how we're schooling our kids. Mm. And because of this, I moved from teaching physics to uh, career tech education, career tech education, or new boat tech, as we yeah. call it. Uh, now I uh, work in automation uh, manufacturing, mm. robotics, three separate tracks. Very good. And I'm trying to push out my school and all my after school parts. Anyways, <laughs> the thought is so in this country, we push this model of accreditation to the achievement of degrees and almost creating these barriers of entry for specific industries and jobs because our employers are you know, controlling a lot of who can have access to what and what quality of accreditation they get, whether it be a top-ranked institution or maybe at, down at the bottom. Here in Nevada, we struggle with that in our higher education system. Mm -hmm. And for me, as someone who is trying to figure out where industry needs are, uh, yeah. where education is meeting them, and where we can, especially as a society, if we truly believe in this country, purpose through our work and for them. How can we better school our kids so that, for example, things like automation and manufacturing and all these advancements in computer science, technology innovation is going like a rocket into the sky, and here we are just trying to leap at it, and I feel like we're throwing a lot of money and a lot of time, especially with the youth who try out teaching and then they quit yeah. after two, three years because of lack of mentorship or knowledge or extra supports, much less loans. You know, I think purpose is something that guides people in this country and in America. Well, I came here as a refugee from Vietnam and my parents you know, through a camp in Hong Kong. Um, there's a story to that. You know, everyone has a story to their, their American uh, history. But I think with schooling in particular, especially for Asian American immigrants, that is seen as that golden path. I feel like that golden path has been, I don't want to say hijacked, but it's been diverted in such a way where there's so many unforeseen, unknown entities that are finding their way into this system, mm. and the most vulnerable of youth, the title one youth that I teach, I'm having to re-educate them on their basic foundational knowledge, teach them the future of automation and computer science, but also fill in this in-between gap of you know, lack of parenting, a lack yep. of stability in the family, all these other things that teachers, not because we're asked to do it, because we have to do it, right. if we truly think and we believe our students can get those you know, high levels of achievement that we can proclaim that is our, our, our goal as a So anyways, my yeah. question is, yeah, so how do we reduce schooling? How do we advance not just the edu education, the cost of it, mm. but truly as a, as a people, as humans, as we advance into the future, how do we actually start focusing on that and not just thinking on every annual report, or every quarterly yeah. report, or, right. or a report card system, or all these yeah. examinations and assessments that are wearing down the minds for you? Right. We have to fix that. So that's why I asked that question. Yeah, I mean, I think... You know, you're at the front line of, of citizenship. You're at the front line sometimes of, of uh, uh, family, uh, the front lines of mental health a lot of the time. And I talk to a lot of teachers who feel like teaching is actually being automated through the over-reliance on standardized testing, um, which kind of slices and dices these experiences, I think, into uh, uh, some of the parts of credentialing that you're talking about. The credentialing and the accreditation is important, but we've got to rethink it for the future. One of the things we're piloting in my city, uh, because we're just big enough that we have every problem, but we're small enough that we can try things, uh, we, we've uh, encouraged foundations to use us as a test bed for new ideas. And we're partnering with the Drucker Institute to create a lifelong learning platform to try to better align the kinds of skills you get. Anywhere from uh, eighth grade diploma or uh, a CPE certification to a college degree to a um, uh, an apprenticeship uh, or trade certification that you can get at the Carpenters uh, facility here in Las Vegas or anything in between um, to try to create a format for us to capture these kinds of things uh, and to better align them with what employers need and are looking for. And part, part of what strikes me about the, the distinction you're drawing between maybe education in a narrow, narrow sense and schooling is that we're not just creating workers, right? We're creating citizens. We're creating... Um, parents, future, future parents and, and, and community leaders. 
And it's part of why all of these issues that intersect with the school that you're facing um, need to be looked at with a, with a broader lens. So uh, it's one of the reasons I, I, I strongly believe in the model of community schools, where we look at the school as a real hub for the kinds of wraparound that need to happen for a child's development. Not all of which should fall on you as a teacher, right, to handle. Although uh, I'm moved by the way that teachers uh, like you and, and like Chaston really involve themselves in the bigger picture of their students' lives. Um, but we've seen everything from some districts where they uh, put laundry machines at schools, uh, not only in order to meet a basic need, but in order to encourage parents to get to know each other to create the kind of social infrastructure that helps determine whether a kid will succeed all the way through to making sure that we have the right kind of before and after school programming and supports, uh, which is part of where a city and a state can support the school system. They shouldn't be asked to carry these things on their own. At the end of the day, I don't think we're going to figure this out in Washington. Um, but one pattern you'll see across a lot of our policy ideas is that while the answers don't all have to come from Washington, more of the funding should. So what we want to do is empower communities to develop plans and share what works in supporting a whole child on everything from aligning the, the, the teaching and extracurriculars toward a, a, the world of automation to building up the kind of civic education and, and social and emotional learning that we know is only going to be more important to just the basics of making sure kids are covered with the kind of mental health and, and nutrition support that they need to succeed. That as you develop different approaches for that, that we uh, fund those kinds of ideas and we create spaces to circulate what's working best among different uh, buildings, among different districts, and among different communities uh, so that it spreads more, more widely. The federal government should be supporting that kind of thing uh, without believing that we can figure it all out and, and automate the solutions from Washington. And I want to congratulate Ben because he was uh, Teacher of the Year I right. think, this year. Congratulations. <laughs> That's what it does. That right. was, so, it was, congratulations. It was, Actually, question. Yeah. <laughs> Go so, ahead. So I'm going to ask a question. Uh, I formerly uh, was a role of the Nevada State Commission on Minority Affairs here in Nevada. As you may know, we are a majority minority state. Uh, one of the assignments was the Subcommittee of Economic Development, which primarily targeted minority entrepreneurs. Um, and one of the kind of the biggest issues we had is obviously we were talking earlier is access to capital. Mm -hmm. Um, but also resources in general to teach them how to build business plans, how to do government bidding, contracts, uh, even awareness about uh, disadvantaged business enterprises or certifications yes. like MBEs. Um, but then also when you talk to, say, infrastructure projects for federal contracting, these entrepreneurs not only didn't know how to be, you know, get engaged with vendor procurement or bidding, uh, but also to get that certification and also a lot of these contracts were given out to <coughs> non-minority GC, general contractors. Mm -hmm. So looking at a federal level and even the MBDA, uh, what can, in, under your administration, how would you be able to help you know, minority entrepreneurs? Yeah, this is really important. We've worked on these issues in my community as well, where we, we started with, well, the big problem is we didn't have the data this aggregate, like we were talking <laughs> about, but not at all. Yeah. Uh, and so we knew it was likely that the city's procurement with minority-owned businesses was low, but we didn't have a, a way to prove it. So created the office capable of doing it, gathered the data, commissioned the study, uh, were able to prove what we already knew, which was that it was too low. And that, under our state law, finally made it possible for me to sign into law hard targets. In the meantime, on that path, we did seminars, uh, events. Uh, as you know, there's a lot of entities that don't go the route of certification because they, they, first of all, they don't know if it's going to be worth the trouble or, or they don't even know about it. And then there are other obstacles like licensing and bonding that make it hard for them to ever get to scale that gets them to, to where even the well-intentioned and well-designed programs can ever catch up with them. I believe that the powers of the presidency can unlock a lot of these problems because so often what you hit up against is just a low availability number to begin with in a given region, right? Mm -hmm. But we have to take responsibility for the availability. Get, for example, in my city, uh, the availability of African-American businesses was rated at 3%. So, but we're at 25% African-American city. So hitting 3% isn't really the point. We've got to do that, but we've got to actually make sure there's more businesses to begin with. And from a broader DV perspective, we've got to make sure that we are encouraging entrepreneurship from everyone who's historically been excluded. I believe we should embrace a 25% target at the federal level. Uh, we, we have the capacity as a country to do this. And at the federal level, uh, you can reach to an entire nation's worth of 
of people who can then network among themselves in the minority chambers that exist across the country. Uh, but we need to back that with co-investment. So I'm proposing a $10 billion fund that would co-invest. This is done in Maryland. That there are models for this to work. Uh, some other countries have done this too, to try to make more of that capital available. Uh, we also know that reforms to the credit system would make more capital available. I'm shocked by how many minority-owned small businesses that clearly know what they're doing. I say, how'd you get up and running? And they always say, cash. They, 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 they couldn't <laughs> save up the cash. Um, so we know that part of this has to do with, with directing credit and, and capital to uh, these under-resourced or underestimated businesses. Um, we also know that, that uh, a lot of these things get unpacked at the community level, but, but with federal networking uh, can help people deal with what's often kind of an insider game. It's, it's informal knowledge that helps people know how to qualify uh, or how to succeed in navigating these big processes. The processes have to be something better, right, in order to be easier to navigate. Uh, so there are a lot of steps that we have to take, but uh, I see so much potential. Uh, if we take it seriously. And the other thing that you mentioned that I think is really important is it matters whether you're the general contractor or the sub. Mm -hmm. And we want to make sure that these DBs are as often as possible uh, in the, the, the general seat mm -hmm. uh, rather than uh, just kind of filling out uh, some of the requirements. And we should make sure that our scoring reflects that too. One quick thing is yeah. uh, LGBT entrepreneurs, I don't know if that falls under the classification of DBs. Uh, I've yeah. looked into it, but I'm not sure. Yeah, it really varies in, in different areas. I do think that we should we should look anywhere there's a disparity. We should be ready to have intention to do something about it. Great. Uh, oh, <laughs> ladies first. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Evelyn Lanzar. I'm a resident of Nevada. This question, with so many things going on, with a lot of problems with job, education, if you are elected the president, what is your priority to Mm. So there's going to be a lot of work to do. There's just going to be a lot of damage to undo, I think, for the new president. But uh, let me mention three areas that I think require uh, a lot of attention on day one. Um, one of them is climate. We know that, that uh, we are close to the point of no return uh, on climate change. And we know that the harms of climate change also disproportionately impact those who are already the most vulnerable. And it's everywhere from... Uh, uh, hot uh, desert communities that are seeing more extreme heat to uh, river communities like mine that are seeing more flooding to coastal communities that are seeing sea level rise to a place in California where there are wildfires. That's upon us now. It's an emergency. The good news is, as Nevada has shown us, there is a lot of opportunity and job creation uh, to be found if we tackle this issue in the right way. From greater renewable energy to good old-fashioned building trades jobs in retrofitting buildings. So there's a lot of work on climate. Rejoining Paris Climate Accord right away. Uh, but then a whole bunch of other activities that need to happen quickly with federal leadership. Another area I think is very important is our democracy itself. We have voter suppression. We have gerrymandering, manipulating districts. As long as Citizens United stands, we have, we're going to have these problems with money and politics. Um, these things require swift attention. Some of the things will take a generation to deliver. I think it will take, it might take a constitutional amendment to fix Citizens United. So we should start now because we know how long it will take. Other things you could do on day one, automatic voter registration, making election day a holiday, uh, uh, making sure that you, uh, we have a, uh, a, a setup for voting rights that, that benefits uh, underprivileged voters. That we could do right away. Some things will take longer. So there's democracy. Another is the racial and economic inequality that is tearing our country apart. And again, there's uh, a lot of work that we can do right away with an American majority that agrees with us, by the way. That we need a higher minimum wage and better labor protections and uh, more opportunities to, to form a union. A lot of uh, higher taxes on those that have been escaping taxes, giant corporations and the wealthy. Um, that all of that can, can I believe, uh, get work right away. So. All of those things, I've committed to move on an immigration bill in the first 100 days. It's going to be a busy 100 days, but it's going to be a busy few years. Can I just ask you something about taxes? Mm. Can you change, remember how taxes were given to the wealthy? Mm -hmm. Is there any way that you can put Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have to reverse the Trump tax. We just got some new data a couple of days ago in a study of the largest corporations 
Many of them are actually effectively paying negative taxes, from Chevron to Amazon to Starbucks, uh, zero or negative taxes on billions of dollars in profits. Meanwhile, we've become a country where actually the very wealthiest pay less as a proportion of their income than, than you or I do. And that's got to be switched. So we can do it. <laughs> and here's the good news. Again, the American people want this to happen. Uh, and so the question is, are we willing and able to engage that majority to get the job done? But we, we have to. You know, uh, one of the issues I think we should talk about more in my party is fiscal responsibility and the deficit. Because we've seen the Republican Party, they always bring up the deficit when we want to invest in something, roads, schools, whatever. There's now a trillion-dollar deficit and growing under this president. Mostly, not because of a lot of spending. They've cut the spending, even on areas where we needed it, but because of these tax cuts that are going to the wealthiest and to the corporations. Uh, we can reverse that, and we should, uh, because that's how we actually pay for all of the things I'm proposing we do, from infrastructure to education. Um, good evening. Uh, my name is Tarek Sibula. I'm a lawyer. I'm a lobbyist in town. But more importantly, I'm an active member of the Muslim community here. Uh, one of the things that fell under the radar and keeping up with the day-to-day -day, uh, drama in D.C. Uh, has been what's occurred with respect to Presidential Proclamation 9645, uh, which succeeded uh, President Trump's third executive order, uh, widely referred to as the Muslim uh, travel ban. Um, if you're elected president, would you commit to repealing that Presidential Proclamation as well as that executive order, uh, which has had a huge impact on our community, approximately 20,000 Muslims in Las Vegas, and 3.4 million Muslims nationwide. Uh, and I know firsthand uh, after uh, the ban was issued, we had story after story coming to us about family members and others uh, who were stopped from re-entering the country. Obviously, this has uh, been upheld by the United States Supreme Court since that time, and uh, an analogy of the Korematsu decision uh, was in the dissent. But uh, it's fallen largely under the radar probably in keeping up with every other you know, crazy element that's happened in the last year and a half. But would you commit to repealing uh, that proclamation and that executive order of the president? Yes. The travel ban, in my opinion, is unconstitutional. It goes against American values. Uh, and it is clearly discriminatory. And I'm glad you raised it. You're right. Here's something that, uh, because there have been, there's a new outrage every day, we forget that the older outrages haven't gone away. And that includes uh, uh, the Islamophobia in general and the travel ban in particular. The day it went into effect, I, I participated in a protest at, at an airport. I was in Houston at the time. And one of the things that was so inspiring was to see how many people in the community, in a place that doesn't have a reputation for progressive politics, uh, knew the importance of standing up for, for this American value, and people of every different background. Uh, and we need to send a message. Again, part of that culture of belonging is respecting uh, that this is a country that belongs to people of every religion and of no religion equally. And it should never be used, especially uh, because this has no bearing on safety. Uh, I, I was involved in counterterrorism work when I was in the military. There are lots of systems for making sure that our country is safe. From, uh, uh, from any terrorist threat, especially when it comes to who is able to, to visit the U.S., an incredibly strict set of checks and protocols um, that is already there. So adding a religious discrimination layer or a by-country discrimination layer does nothing to make us safe. And I think it harms our country's safety in the long run by undercutting the values that consist uh, or, or that compose the moral authority that in our best moments we as a nation have. Um, and I know that the, the Muslim community, not only the Muslim community, but the Muslim community feels targeted right now uh, in so many ways. And it was important to me um, after uh, what happened in New Zealand to, uh, uh, to make contact with the masjid in our own community uh, and make sure that everybody there knew our community's view that uh, they were not just accepted, but uh, that we were thankful for their presence. Uh, and the same is true of all of the diverse communities that make up uh, our, our American life. So thank you for your time. Thank you. I'll move over here. Uh, Mayor, I want to thank you again for joining us here. Uh, my name is Zahn Kudalim. I uh, work as policy director for a local education nonprofit. I appreciate um, hearing from you about your education plan. Uh, 
going to ask you a question about education, but I think I want to take a step out of some specific policy <coughs> areas and just talk about what it means to be a public service today and get some of your thoughts. Um, as a as a young millennial, mm -hmm. happy to see you know we have a whole range here. Um, but as a young person in, in this community, I sometimes have been I felt kind of torn in terms of how much change I as one person could make, given just how vitriolic politics um, can seem. Mm -hmm. On news, look at the newspaper, look on social media, and I just want to get your thoughts as someone who is living public service and has answered that call, um, what is your, what advice would you have, what are your reflections for um, everyone in the room, especially those of us who are, who are um, of the younger generation, yeah. as we're hearing about what's happening, as we're trying to find inspiration through uh, what's happening in politics, what's your advice for us on how to just navigate that tension and, yeah. and continue to answer that, that call to public service as so many of us want to yeah. Well, my biggest message is to stay after it because I think that there's a, lot of, there's a lot of effort to kind of get us so exhausted and so beaten down that we feel that kind of helplessness, and that's how they went. I've been thinking about it a lot in terms of the impeachment process. On one hand, I, I'm, I'm glad to see the House stand up and draw a line. But I think because we're watching this process and we expect that it will be a foregone conclusion when it gets to the Senate, even watching this process may deepen our sense of, of frustration uh, and, and that nothing seems to make a difference out there. And yet, I've seen the power, especially at the local level and the state level. Look at Nevada. You know, look at what you all have been able to do in terms of good policies. Now, I live in a state where there is a, a supermajority on the other side, and uh, it, it's very unlikely that, that any meaningful idea empowering workers, for example, will, will even see the light of day. I also visit states like New Hampshire, where they have a fantastic legislature, but very little good legislation actually gets past the veto pen. They, uh, they did paid family leave. The governor was so proud of his veto that he auctioned off the pen he used to veto it to raise money for the party. Here, you've got your challenges, of course, but we see what happens, right? When you get uh, a, an assembly, uh, a governor, and a state that are that are ready to move in the right direction on so many issues, um, and it's been worse. America has been through worse. Don't get me wrong; it's really bad right now. <laughs> But every time it's gone from worse to better, it's been because people stood up and got involved, whether it's activism, advocacy, or just service. And now of all times is the, the, the moment that we've got to stay after it, precisely because it's so exhausting. I get it. You go on Twitter and uh, you go on the news and it feels like getting punched in the face all the time, especially when you actually run, let me tell you. I mean, between the absurdity that I feel like uh, we're getting from the other side to the friendly fire that I get from my own competitors where we more or less have the same values, we're just competing, right? Um, it's tough out there, but also this is the best, uh, the, the best thing we have going for us is that actually we get to decide. Uh, again, using the impeachment as an example, we can, we can watch what happens in the, on the floor of the Senate and feel kind of powerless, but... 2020 is when we get to decide, and we can send a message in, in, in local and state and, and certainly in the national election about our readiness to make sure things are different. And it won't be easy, and it won't come overnight, and winning will just touch off the next era. That's really when the hard part comes. But the other thing that I would take heart in is that most people get it. Most people want us to do the right thing on wages, on education, on immigration, on guns. Areas where I feel like folks on my side have been on defense, most people are with us, which is exactly why I think they need us to feel helpless, to feel beaten down, or to be distracted by whatever crazy nonsense is being put out on Twitter today. And we have to, to keep our focus on, I believe every election is about this question. As a voter, how is my life going to be different if you're in this office instead of you? And if we have the right answers on that, the rest is noise. 
We just got to make sure we cut through the noise. Well, we want to be very thankful for Mayor Pete for coming out here and be sensitive of this time because I know he has a very busy campaign <laughs> schedule as always. Uh, but we want to say thank you to all of you that have really came here, attended here, put out your voices, continue to elevate our voices in Asian Americans in our community. And I can pass it on to Assemblywoman Rochelle to kind of close out any remarks and thank the mayor. No, I, I'm always <laughs> thankful for the conversation and real conversations with um, about topics that are matter to Nevada uh, and matter to all Americans, really. So uh, we appreciate your time and we appreciate you coming to answer some of our questions. I know that there are a lot of other questions out there for other people, so um, I encourage you to stay involved. I think that is important. Um, so, so thank you. Our team will be happy to follow up. So thanks very much.